Um, welcome everyone. My name is Elliot Stapleton. Uh, I am from the Camus Public Library and I'm just excited for Soil Basics. Um, this is a presentation uh, by Art Fuller and uh, this event is uh, co-hosted by Naturescaping of Southwest Washington and the Camus Public Library. Uh, I'm just gonna give a few uh, housekeeping uh, items before turning things over to Marlene from Naturescaping of Southwest Washington. Um, uh, just showed up in the chat, but um, I wanna let you know that this presentation will be recorded um, and I will send a follow-up email to everyone who registered for this presentation when the recording is ready to view. The recording will be posted on the YouTube page of the Camus Public Library. And once that recording is uh, ready, I'll send that follow-up email uh, probably early next week. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask Art questions. Um, we will wait uh, until the end of uh, Art's presentation uh, to answer questions. However, if you have a question and you wanted to um, share it right away, feel free to type it into the chat um, and then we'll just get to uh, as many questions as we can uh, after Art's presentation. Uh, it will also be possible to uh, ask your question out loud um, at the end of the presentation. You can do that by using the raise hand icon at the bottom of the, your Zoom window. Um, and so there'll be two ways you can, you can ask questions at the end of the presentation. Um, I think that's it for me. So I'm just gonna turn things over to Marlene from Naturescaping of Southwest Washington. Marlene. Hi, thank you, Elliot. And I wanna thank Elliot as usual for being a wonderful partner with our presentations. It's been going on for quite a number of months now and we really appreciate the library and Elliot's efforts. So yes, I am from Naturescaping in Southwest Washington. For those of you on this Zoom presentation that are members, you are well aware of me. Um, I send out the newsletters and all the other email items. And for those of you who are not members, welcome. If you would be interested in becoming a member, in which case these Zoom class, well, if when we are able to meet again in person, we you know, this is one of the benefits of membership. So you would be able to participate in any upcoming classes. Also, we will be having a plant sale at the end of April, which is Saturday, April 30th and Sunday, May 1st. Um, it's our annual fundraising plant sale. Again, for those of you who are members who are uh, familiar with our plant sale. And uh, for those of you who are not, please feel free to check our website. Uh, our website and my email address will be, Elliot's gonna put that in the chat. So feel free to check our website. At some point, we will have a list of the plants available once we know what they are. So keep checking back. And if you are interested in working at the plant sale, in which case you earn a free plant, just contact me directly at the email that Elliot's gonna put in there. And we'll be happy to use you. And uh, we need lots of help for the plan sale to make it a success. So um, that was uh, one announcement. And I just want you all to know that there will not be a class in April from us because of the plan sale. But we will start up again in May. And we already have a fabulous speaker lined up. But you're going to have to wait and find out who that is. So anyway, um, we appreciate any donations that you wanna send our way, you can do that online now. So just check again, check our website and the information's there. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Art and Art is going to tell you all about himself and we'll get started. Thank you so much to everyone. All right, good evening everybody or good afternoon everybody. It's not quite evening yet. But I want to welcome you to this presentation. It's going to combine a little bit of soil, and we're going to talk a little bit about fertilization of the soil and how to make your plants really thrive. A little bit about myself. I'm a master gardener with Collitz County. I've been a master gardener for since 2014. 
Um, before I started into gardening, I used to garden with my parents and my grandparents back in Pennsylvania. Back when I was about three to four years old, I wasn't very much help at that age, but as I grew, I really became passionate with all the gardening. So I left Pennsylvania in 1983 and joined the Navy for 30 years, moved to Hawaii for two years, learned how to garden there. And then for uh, two years, I was in Hawaii. You learn a whole different type of gardening. Then I moved to California for 25 years. And that's another type of gardening. And then came up to Washington State and been up here since 2005. And that's another type of gardening. So I've learned gardening on the East Coast, the South Pacific, and then the West Coast. So it's been a real challenge to learn all the different uh, styles of gardening in the different states that I've lived. So tonight we're gonna get going on this and we're gonna start off with uh, soils part of it and some words of wisdom to start the lesson. So I'll let you read that real quick. And then the success of your garden depends on your soil, so don't treat it like dirt. So I found that a while back and I thought that was a pretty good, drives the stake home a little bit on how you treat your soil. And soil is your foundation of your garden. So as it says, if you don't have a good soil and a good base, you're in for a blueprint for failure. So some important key points we're gonna keep in mind on. We're gonna talk about some do-it-yourself tests, basically soil texture and how to do a perk test, a real quick one. And soil testing should be done before you start growing so you get a feel for your soil. When to add lime, best to add it in the fall if needed. And then we're gonna cover some composting, garden planning, and we're gonna talk about some cool season crops and here they are here. And semi-hardy crops. So these, these different types of crops are gonna depend on the types of seasons you're in. So here's what we're gonna to cover tonight. The soil foundation, soil structure, soil testing, soil nutrients. Nitrogen cycle, soil pH, fertilizing, composting, rototilling, mulches, manures, and that's it. Here's a pretty good statement. It takes more than 500 years to form one inch of topsoil. So you have to be really careful so you don't disrupt that and ruin your topsoil. So that's just an uh, an idea of how long it takes to form topsoil on the ground. Okay, what is soil? There's some good pictures of it, but soil is a mixture of weathered rock fragments and organic matter at the earth's surface. It's biologically active, a home for countless microorganisms, invertebrates and plant roots. And we're gonna discuss what happens with all that as we go through this lesson and why these are important to make your soil good. It's gotta be porous. It provides the nutrients for your plants, the energy, the carbon dioxide, water, and then a little bit about more about soil foundations. Your productive soil is permeable to water and can supply water to plants. And this permeability de depends on its porosity. So you have macro pores and you have micro pores in that soil. And there's a combination of both of these. So as you can see, if you have coarse sand or fine sand, you can see the difference on how dense that soil is between the two. 
So here's just some size comparison. Now, if you look at sand, sand's a little bit bigger than silt and clay. And here's a comparison of all three of them. This is real world look. So a barrel would be like a comparison of sand. A plate would be like a comparison of how big silt is. And a coin would be about how big clay is. So you have some shape comparisons here. So if you look at this, what do you see different between the shapes of sand and silt versus clay? If you look at this diagram right here, you can see your sand and your silt has a roundish shape, but your clay is actually flat. So that's your difference between the three of them. And as that clay is flat, it, it will flat and lay against each other and it prevents water and that's how it retains water from draining. Some more on soil structure. Okay, as these clay, silt, and sand all combine with each other, they form PEDs. And this is what a PED is like. So that's that combination of all three. Okay, the biggest problem that you have is damaging soil. So the biggest problem you have is compaction. And that's just, I mean, compaction can occur just by walking on the soil. How you prevent it, you can use tillage. However, if you use excessive tillage, it interrupts the delicate cycles. And as you compact it more, you lose a lot, you have a loss of organic matter. So here's a description of two different um, types of soil. There's loose soil and compacted soil. Now, if you try to run water through that loose soil, it would work very easily. However, if it's compacted, you'd have a hard time getting water down through there. So the best way to, if you do get compacted soil, the best way to loosen it up is to add organic material, such as compost. Here's a picture of what soil compaction does. On the left-hand side, you have good soil structure. You can see how far those roots are reaching down from a plant. On the right-hand side, it's compacted soil, and you can see how, how, um, how little the roots are trying to move out of that soil area. They can't because it's so compacted, they have a hard time getting through the soil. So most of the soil in our areas, at least up in, I'm from Windlock area, it's the majority of that soil is clay and a lot of uh, western Washington is clay. So here we're going to talk a little bit about some quick home soil tests you can do to find out what your texture of soil is and that's the first one we're going to cover. So if you're looking at a container and this is all separate we're going to show you how to do this test but if you let it settle into water you have a 10, 30, and 60% separation between these three different types of soils or these three different types of um, particles in soil. So we're going to cover a percolation test. And that's basically, you're just going to dig a hole in your soil and uh, time your drainage of water. Both these tests go hand in hand with each other. So let's get into that soil texture. So to get a soil texture, you wanna collect a sample from your root zone of your plant. So you dig it up, you collect it. You wanna put it in some sort of pan and you wanna separate and sift out the rocks and the roots. And you just wanna have a good representative sample of that soil. So you're gonna get a one quart jug. You're gonna put this soil halfway in, fill that jug halfway with soil. Then you're gonna add a tablespoon of powdered dishwashing detergent. You can also use a liquid dishwashing detergent since powder is hard to find anymore. 
And all that does is helps uh, keeps the soil particles separate for a more accurate test. You're going to fill to the top, leaving about one inch of headspace with water. Then you're going to tighten the lid and shake it. Make sure you do this in a safe spot in case the lid is not tight so you don't make a mess. Better do it outside or over a sink. Then you're just going to set it down and let it all settle. Once it settles, you're going to mark your levels. And as you can see, they've marked the levels there. You have your clay. Clay is always lighter. It's on top. Silt is in the, the next layer and sand is the bottom layer. So once you get your layers, then all you do is you measure. And you're doing a total estimate of the three. You do not count the water height. So this is what they call the soil triangle. So if you look at this last picture, you had a 17% clay, 66% silt, and 17% sand mixture of your soil. So what you're gonna end up doing is you're gonna end up plotting it on this triangle, and it's gonna tell you what type of soil you have. So your first one was 17% clay. If you go on the left-hand side of that triangle and go up, you can see there's right between the 10 and the 20, there's the halfway point 15. So you're gonna be right around in that area where my cursor's sitting. So the next one was 66 silt. So 66, the silt side is on the right-hand side of this triangle. So you're gonna find the 66 mark. So there's your 65, go down to the 66, come down to where your clay level was. And you can see you're falling right into that silt loam type texture. And then if you follow out the last, it's gonna fall down right into that sand level. So you really basically only have to have two to figure out the third, it'll triangulate out for you. So that's where you're gonna get your silt and your loam type soil. So here's three different types that's showing you, your sand, your loam, and your clay. And as you look at those percentages, that's where it's gonna fall in each of those in, in that triangular area. So we're gonna do a little bit of uh, just some samples here. So if you have a 35% clay and a 30% silt, and if you follow this over, and 30% silt, you're going to find out that you're going to be right in that area right there, a clay loam. And if you follow that down, it's going to hit right into that 35% for your sand. I think I have about three or four of these. So here's a 10% clay. So you follow it over. Then you're going to find a 60%. 60% is over here. So you see you're going to hit into that silty loam, and 30% is right there. So if you see it, you're going to be in that silt loam texture. Here's another one at 20%. You follow this over, 35%. So that's going to look like it's going to be right in the loam area. And you follow down, it'll be 45 and that's definitely gonna be in your loam area. Okay, clay is 60, that's an easy one. It's all the way up to the top three quarters of your triangle and just fall, it's all clay up there. So that's gonna hit right into your clay area. And this should be the last one, I think. 5%. And follow it over to 85%, and you're going to fall right into this silt area. So your triangulation is pretty easy to figure out, and that triangulation will let you know 
what kind of texture you have for your soil. And don't get me wrong, clay is okay, you know, loam is okay, but you want a good mixture so you have good drainage and your, your, your plants that you're planting thrive. So here's the last of the do-it-yourself tests. This one here is the percolation test. And this basically, all this does is tell you how fast the water drains. And, so, and that's important so you know how often you have to water your plants. So this is a real easy test to do. Just dig a hole approximately one foot by one foot. So one foot deep, one foot in diameter. Just set that soil off to the side. Once you get the hole dug, you're gonna fill it with water and allow it to drain. Once it's drained, you immediately fill it back up again. And I put a stick across there just to keep it straight and I'll put a tape measure in there or a ruler. And you're gonna, what you wanna do is you wanna time it for a 15 minute period. So you're gonna need a stopwatch of some sort and you can see the scale right there on the stick and you're gonna watch it and see how far it drains in 15 minutes. So you just multiply that by four and that tells you how fast it's gonna drain per hour. And that's basically all it is for a percolation tests. Now, what does all this mean? So the ideal soil drainage is about two inches per hour. So with readings between one to three inches, generally okay for gardens that have average drainage needs. If the rate is one inch per hour, your drainage is too slow and you need to improve the drainage. If it's more than four inches per hour, it's too fast. And once again, you need to amend your soil to get it to drain a little bit slower. How do you do that? We'll tell you here in a second. But if you're looking here, if you have a clay, silt and sand, you can see how much the water penetrates down through each of these. Sand is a little bit, uh, it's about three times more than the clay. Silt's about two times more than clay. So if you get right in that sand and uh, you're, if you get a good mixture, you have a good drainage. So addressing the issues, it, whatever you need to do, compost is usually the best answer for it all. Organic material helps the heavy clay soil to drain and it helps coarse sandy soil to hold moisture. So it's a win-win situation no matter what you do. If you're adding compost, it's gonna uh, just amend your soil immensely. You can choose the right plants for the soil, build raised beds and control the soil, the type of soil texture you put in there. So those are your alternatives to taking care of the problem. Okay, soil testing. Should be done about every th two to three years. Okay, this, this site here is uh, right here and I'm pretty sure it's in Washington. And I got a page from them. And okay, okay, the important thing to remember is to be sure Whenever you get a soil analysis done from people to make sure you understand what the analysis says. So you're gonna get a bunch of figures back, make sure that those are explained very well by the people conducting the tests so you understand what has to be done. I can't stress that enough. If you go to the, the Simply Soil Testing, they're very good and they explain it right, every detail that they send you back They'll explain everything step by step of the way. There are a few test kits out there that you can use, that you can buy. Um, the rapid test is one that uh, I've seen the most out there. And it, it runs anywhere from 14 to $20. You can pick them up at Home Depot, Ace Hardwares, uh, Lowe's, 
You can order them on Amazon. They're not as good as the, um, getting a laboratory done, but it gives you an approximation of where you're sitting. Here's that uh, page I was telling you about. Um, if you look and get the complete test is $32. So that's all the tests up above for your soil sample but you just send it in to these people that test it and they'll give you all the results. And these tests, uh, these prices, I got them from uh, a class I taught earlier. So these are accurate up to February of 2022. And actually the prices have not changed from year to year. Last year it was the same price and the year before that was the same price. Oh, by the way, your results come back in about three to four, three days to 10 days max. Okay, here's the rapid test. The rapid test kit, the best part of this test kit is when you buy the kit, there's a table in there that has about 450 plants in it that tell you the pH levels for those plants. As for the accuracy, it does not give you a precise reading, but it basically tells you if your primary nutrients that's your nitrogen, your phosphorus, and your uh, potassium, and pH levels are high or low. A lab test will give you precise measurements, and they get into your primary and your secondary um, micronutrient levels. So this is what the rapid test looks like. Um, it has four test canisters in there. And you can do 10 tests. It gives you, uh, you can do 40 tests total, but 10 tests per, per um, test kit. Your macronutrients can be broken down into two groups. You've got your primaries, which is your NPK. So anytime you buy fertilizer, that's what they're talking about. Your nitrogen, your phosphorus, and your, potass or your potassium. Your, second, your secondary nutrients are your calcium, your magnesium, your sulfur, your boron, everything else besides your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Soil nutrients, you have 14 essential nutrients and you have three primary nutrients. NPK are your primary. And this is what a fertilizer bag looks like. 19, 19, 19. So that's telling you you have 19% nitrogen, 19% phosphorus, and 19% potassium. Another example. And here's your, um, your secondary nutrients and your micronutrients. Importance of MPK. This is the easiest way I know how to explain it. Your nitrogen takes care of your fo foliage. Your phosphorus gives you the strength in your roots and your potassium is your health, healthy growth. And that gives you, it's basically like the circulatory system of the plant. So your leaf, flower, and your stem and your roots. So if you look at your MPK, anytime you're looking at this, the easiest way to remember it is up, down, all around. So nitrogen, once again, is for your leaves. Phosphorus is down for your roots. And your potassium is for all around. That's your circulatory system for your uh, plant. So up, down, all around. This is going to be a picture of your secondary nutrients, and it's going to show you what it does to different leaves. I'm not going to get too much into that. But the nitrogen cycle, the nitrogen cycle is very important for the plants. So as you can see the rabbit there, it's um, basically leaving manure. The manure is going to go down. It's going to get broke down into the soil. And then the microbes inside the soil are going to break it down and it's going to send it back into the plants. 
And this plays an important part. As you can see the cycle, the, the um, organic fertilizer, such as the rabbit manure, it takes longer to get to the plant than it does with inorganic fertilizer. Inorganic fertilizer goes right back or straight back into the plants very quickly. So that's an important part when you're deciding what kind of fertilizer to buy and what kind of type you use. Okay, soil pH. Soil pH is the measure of the acidity or the alkalinity of the soil. Okay, it's at seven on a pH scale, you're at neutral. So you can see it's like pure water. And as you go up in numbers, you're getting more alkaline. As you decrease in numbers, it becomes more acidic. When moving either way, it's, it increases by a factor of 10. So if you go 5.5 is 10 times more acidic than 6.5. And some plants require different pH levels than other. And when I was telling you about that rapid test, if you remember, there's that table in there, it tells you all your pH levels. So it tells you exactly where you need to be. And as your pH increases or decreases, it also affects how the nutrients reach the plants. And we're gonna show you some pictures of that too. Okay, it can be if affects your availability of toxic metals. It affects the microorganisms, how they react. So as you look at this scale, your 6.2 to 7 is pretty normal. And that's where your ground and your lawns right here are very lush. But as you can see, as you go up and down the scale, what it does and how the plants you know, thrive and don't thrive as you're going up and down your scale. So that's kind of important to uh, know where your pH level is in your pro on your property. And this is another chart that's pretty important. These are how the nitrogen and all your um, nutrients get taken in by your plants. So as it goes up and down, it decreases. Some will increase as it goes. But this basically takes you how your uh, basic nutrients are absorbed into your plants. And here's just some things that um, I picked um, randomly, but your pH level for beans, broccoli, corn, melons, pepper, pumpkin, squash, peas, beets, chives, cucumber, grape, peach, radish, and tomato, is 6.5 to 7.5, It's pretty close to neutral. So here's another different range for seven to eight, your asparagus, cabbage, celery, lettuce, spinach, beets, cauliflower, carrot, and parsley. If you get down a little bit below, yeah, that's seven, you get into the six to seven, you get your potato, your raspberries, your strawberry, and your grape. A lot of people like blueberries. That's going to be the next one. 4.5 to 5.5. That's getting into the acidic range. Your blueberries, your azalea, your cranberries, your rhododendrons. So you have to really watch when you're trying to grow these. How to increase and decrease your pH. The most common way to increase pH is to add lime. Dolmatic lime contains magnesium as well as calcium. It's a good choice for gardeners in Western Washington and Oregon. So that will definitely bring your pH up. To decrease it, you wanna add sulfur, lowers your soil pH. Ammonium sulfate, fertilizer, lowers pH. That's a great fertilizer to use for blueberries and azaleas and rhododendrons. And urea will also reduce your pH. 
Now we're going to talk a little bit about fertilizers. Okay, the easiest way I know to explain the difference between organic and or inorganic fertilizers are your organic fertilizers will are um, natural and break down to feed the microorganisms in the soil and finally feed the plants. So your organic fertilizers are a slower feed than your inorganic. Here's some examples of some organic, your manures, bone meal, cottonseed, and there's other materials out there also. Dr. Earth has an organic fertilizer out there. Organic Plus, there's all different types out there. But just remember, if you're using an organic fertilizer, it's a slower nutrient feed to the plant than inorganic. So inorganics are man-made and they feed the plant directly. So if you have a problem in your plant, you see it, uh, say your leaves are yellowing or you're, you're having issues, your plant is starting to wilt a little bit and not in need of water because you're watering it pretty steady. That's when you want to use an inorganic. You want to take care of the problem immediately. So here's an example of a inorganic fertilizer. Excessive nutrients, if you put too much, you always got to follow the instructions. Make sure you follow exactly what it says. If used properly and at the right time, fertilizers are safe for the environment. If you use it at the wrong time, it could migrate the nutrients down to your water tables. Excessive uh, use of nitrogen, it's gonna give you a larger vegetative growth and less fruit production. Over fertilization of vegetables can result in large diameter stocks and less production. So this could happen to your uh, plant if you over fertilize. Make sure you always follow the instructions. And make sure you know, don't just add fertilizer to add fertilizer. Make sure you know where your soil is sitting to add the proper fertilizer you need. That's the best way to do it. Common garden fertilizers types. You have single nutrient fertilizers. There's ammonium sulfate, that 21% nitrogen. You have multi-nutrient fertilizers and complete fertilizers. There's a 6-12-12. That's a multi-nutrient and it's a complete fertilizer. You got balanced fertilizers. That's where you're gonna see your 16, 16, 16, your 10, 10, 10s. Special fertilizers. There's a special fertilizer right there for just uh, turf. And it can also sell by a common name, miracle Grow. All right, your percentages. So if you buy a, a 10 pound bag and it's a 25, three and a five, so that's 25 nitrogen, three for phosphorus, five for potassium. This is how this breaks down. So you multiply that 0.25 by 10, tells you it's 2.5 pounds of nitrogen. The three you multiply, the you convert it down to 0.03 because it's a percent times by 10 tells you it's 0.3 pounds of phosphorus your potassium five pounds 0.05 multiplied by 10 0.5 pounds so if you add those up you come up with a grand total of 3.3 pounds so but you're getting a 10 pound bag so 6.7 pounds are remaining all that is is inert ingredients such as sawdust, cleaner sterile dirt, peat moss, uh, corn cobs, all kinds of products that do not change that NPK. Fertilizing. Most gardeners use a complete fertilizer with twice as much phosphorus 
as pot uh, your nitrogen and potassium. An example would be a 10 20 10 or 12 24 12. These fertilizers are usually pretty easily found. And this is just rough calculations. So if you're using um, two to three pounds of fertilizer, such as a 10 20 10, you want to do that about every 100 square feet, follow the instructions, and you just spread it across that area. I always try to make sure my beds, when I, when I do a raised bed or anything like that, I try to make sure I keep it in even increments, like my beds are uh, four feet by 25 feet, and that breaks down to be 100 square feet, it makes it very easy to figure out when I'm adding fertilizer. Okay, this is where I got that information from Oregon State uh, University. These are your heavy feeders. My, some of my favorite tomato or vegetables I grow are tomatoes and corn. They are heavy feeders. Lettuce is a heavy feeder. Rhubarb, spinach, squashes, they're all heavy feeders. So you have to fertilize them. You watch what your leaves are doing. And if they start turning a yellowish color or um, show you signs that they need uh, nourishment, you give them fertilizer. Light feeders, your bulbs, your chard, your herbs, your mustard, peppers, uh, garlic, leeks, onion, parsnips, potatoes, rutabaga. And then you got uh, fixers, soil builders, alpha beans, alfalfa, beans, clover, and peas. These put nitrogen back into the soil. Okay, regular fertilizer applications keep the plant vigorous and productive. As the plant leaves start turning yellow, fertilizer may help the problem. Too much fertilizer can end up burning the plant, so you have to be careful. Tomatoes and beans given too much fertilizer grows lots of foliage, but little fruit. So be in a well-drained soil, you should feed about every three to four weeks. Don't stop application when fruit appears. Continue to fertilize as to ensure the continued production of the fruit, especially if you've got a determinant, if you're using a determinant type tomato, they're gonna to produce all at once. If you go to an indeterminate type tomato, they're gonna to produce all summer long till the frost. So you just wanna make sure the vegetables have their nutrients they need to keep producing. Composting. Some people recommend late fall as a good time to uh, put composting. Some will say do it in the spring. I compost in the fall, so it has time to break down over the year. And when I go to plant, all I have to do is uh, rototill if necessary. Other recommend to just do it in the springtime, a couple weeks prior to planting. There's no wrong way to do it. Composting is very easy. Okay, amending your garden soil. You need approximately four inches of compost to put down on top of your soil to work in. Here's how to figure it out, the volume of material needed using a 25 by four foot uh, bed. Multiply width by length, gives you your 100 square feet. Then you wanna multiply that area by 0.333, one third of a foot to get the cubic feet needed. And then divide your cubic feet by 27. And it'll tell you a 100 square foot needs about 1.23 cubic yards. When can, when, can clay, or when can clay soil be worked? If it's too wet, 
your soil will form that ball in your hand. If it's too dry, if you, oh, excuse me, if you try to rototill also and you're getting in the soil's too wet, the, the soil will just stick right to your blades. So it ends up becoming a roller if I say tiller. If it's too dry, it's just real powdery. I've seen a lot of that around here in the summertime. You just want that perfect tilling time. To till or not to till is your decision. This is from Oregon State. Tilling performs a, a number of necessary functions. If it needs broken down, you need to till. If it doesn't need broken down and you can dig right into it, you don't need to till. If you do too much tilling, it can cause problems and it breaks down the structure of the soil. Till garden soil only when it will accomplish some useful purpose, such as turning under organic material, controlling weeds, breaking crusted soil for water penetration, or loosening a small amount of soil for planting seeds. So this was my garden, uh, November, 2021. I've already limed it. And what I do is I cover it with tarps and I keep it covered all the way till I go to plant. So this was May of 2021. This was last year. I rototilled the garden. I've also put my drip irrigation. That's that white piping going across back there. That's my water. And over here, if you can see these bins, this is my compost bins. So this is what my soil looks like in my gardens. You can see I got raised beds. I used a cinder block and they are four foot by 25 foot. So that's what my soil looks like. And you can see it's very, very fine, very easy. Uh, it just breaks apart in your hand. It's perfect soil. It took me a lot of years. I've been working on this bed for six years now. Okay, I planted my tomatoes May 19th of 2021. So you can see I, I planted into, into my beds. I put cages around them and I got drip irrigation going to them. Here's the corn I planted. These are, I started them in my greenhouse. I planted the corn the 12th of June. They were already about six to eight inches above the ground. So my goal has always been to hit knee high by the 4th of July. These were waist high by the 4th of July. And that's my drip irrigation system that I put in there. All I used was a soaker hose and I just run it down my rows. After I've planted, I cover those beds with uh, mulch and I use just grass clippings and I spread it all the way down so I don't have to water as much and I don't have to weed. So it brings us into mulch. You can use bark chips. You can use grass clippings. You can use leaves, straw, pine needles, whatever you want to use. Reduces evaporation, protects the soil surface, reduces compaction, smothers weeds, modifies your soil temperature, and here's different types of mulches. So for me, it's a win-win situation. It, it uh, prevents my soil from getting overheated. It um, also prevents me from having to weed. And it also prevents, uh, decreases my watering. So I definitely mulch after I plant. So different types of mulches, pros and cons of them. A little bit about manures. I'm not going to go into this very much, but you can see this chart. This chart's in the PowerPoint. 
Um, if you look, your biggest thing you've got to worry about is you want to make sure that the manure is aged. You want to make sure all parasites or pathogens are gone. So we usually recommend usually a, I, I wait about four to six months before I put manure on my garden. I make sure it's aged and um, broke down very much so. The big thing here uh, I wanna point out, um, if you see chicken manure, that's it's very, very hot um, nitrogen and it burns very quickly. But the reason it does that is because that first year it releases 75% nitrogen, vice other manures only release approximately 33% in the first year. So chicken manure that first year releases nitrogen very quickly. Here's another chart on different types of nutrients and nutrient concentrations. These charts help out a lot just to let you know what it's going to do to your soil and what it's going to help, uh, how much NPK it's going to put in there. That's just a chart to help you out what you want to put in there. So in summary, we covered the soil foundation, soil structure, soil testing, soil nutrients, nitrogen cycle, soil pH, fertilization, composting, rototilling, mulches, manures, and I hope I didn't overload you, and questions, and there's our references. Yeah, and I just uh, stop on to remind people that um, if they have any questions, uh, they can type it into the chats. Uh, you click on the chat icon in the bottom of your Zoom window. You can type in your question. Um, or if you'd like to ask your question out loud, uh, just hit the raise hand icon and I'll um, uh, unmute you um, so you can not ask it aloud. Um, and there were a few things that came in during the talk. Um, and Elliot, real quick, do you want me to stop sharing? Oh, uh, no, no, yeah, that's fine. Um, okay. that's fine there. Mm -hmm. um, actually, one was um, about some of the information uh, in the slides, the link to Oregon State on the fertilizers and just uh, having access to slides. Um, we didn't bring that up uh, beforehand. Oh, that's okay. Uh, I can send you a PDF. Okay. Okay, so uh, when I send out that email with the recording, uh, I will include uh, a link to that PDF so people have those uh, links. Uh, Elliot, well. I'll, need your e I'll need your email so I can send it to you though. No problem, I, I have yours all, we'll, okay. we'll coordinate there. Sure. Um, and kind of related to that, there was a question about uh, reviewing the formula for getting from inches to percentages for a soil uh, texture test. Um, Again, this will be uh, made available in the slides as well. So um, uh, if you want, we can uh, just send that out and you can see the instructions there. Um, and uh, okay, so the next one is, uh, uh, please tell us more about worm casings. Oh, worm castings? Oh, sorry. Yes, I think there are. Yeah. So vermiculture is another type of composting. And it is, I use it all the time. It's a, it's for, um, basically it's for, um, if you don't have room to have a compost bin, worm composting works great. You just get red wiggler worms. Uh, you put them into a bin and they basically break down all your food, your vegetable um, scraps. And they, um, you, uh, you cover it up with paper, you get castings from it, and you just add that as a nutrient for your plants when you plant. Um, I, keep, I keep two bins going constantly, and um, I always have castings. It takes about six months to start getting castings, but once you get them, they just keep going and they thrive. 
So it's it's a it's a different type of composting. It's not a hot composting, it's a cold composting, but it, it works great. Um, and actually one related, uh, the question is, uh, do, do worms give an indication of soil health? Yes, yes, very much so. And also moles. If you have moles or eat, your soil health is pretty healthy. So uh, worms is definitely a, a, a sign that you have good soil. Um, next question is asking about, uh, what about uh, compost tea for fertilizer? Uh, compost tea works great. Uh, what you do is you have a compost pile. Uh, you collect some of that uh, compost up, you bag it up and you make it in, uh, it has to be some type of filtration device that you wrap it in like a, uh, some sort of cotton uh, cloth and you just put it into a jug of water and let that uh, water filter through just like a tea bag. And that's also used for fertilizer. So it works very well. That's, uh, I don't know if, uh, if you ever do composting talks, but co composting is a good lesson to do. We do composting talks a lot. Um, yeah, next uh, question is, um, is it okay to use leaves from bamboo plants? Mm. I'm not familiar with that one. I'd have to look it up to find out an answer. I've never been asked that question. That's a good question though. <laughs> um, uh, okay, next question is, um, uh, do I need to test each bed in my yard? Are you is the question about a raised bed? Is that, or is it? Um, can if you wanted to, um, Add a comment. I can. Uh, I can um, check that. I would. I would not test them all. Um, if you're growing, if you're growing, you want a representative sample. So I guess you could probably, if the beds are close to each other, you could mix the beds together, and get a average of all the beds. But if you're very, if they're real far apart, yes, I would go with different tests or I would get a rapid test and just find out where I'm sitting per bed, which is a little bit cheaper because it's only uh, 15 to 20 bucks to test and you can do 10 beds very easily with a rapid test. Just gotta be, uh, you just gotta remember, you gotta follow the instructions very closely on a rapid test and it's not as accurate as a lab test done. And, um, and did uh, um, clarify, uh, she was referring to uh, established beds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, next question is, um, uh, I have raised beds and always wonder what to do over winter to pre prevent compaction. Do you prefer to cover beds versus planting a cover crop? should raised beds be turned each year? I only turn my bed if it's necessary. If I, if I don't see the, cause I, what I do with my beds, I, once I'm done gardening, I will take all the plants out of the beds. Uh, I pull them out by the roots. I don't leave any rooting systems in there or anything. I pull it all out. I throw it into my compost pile and I cover the beds with I usually spread all my compost on top of the bed. And then what I do is I, when I rake up all my leaves or cut my grass, I'll throw all that on top of my beds. And then that's when I cover it with the tarps and I let it sit all the way until um, the May timeframe. And then I uncover. And if it needs, if the stuff did not break down, then I wrote a till. If it did break down, then I don't wrote a till. So I let the bed tell me whether I got to do it or not. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, next question is, uh, can I add worm castings as a top dressing to a very small lawn instead of synthetic fertilizers? Yeah, let me go back to that other question real quick too. Yeah. Um, she, I think the person asked whether, um, cause I cover my beds, a uh, cover crop works very well also, but you, you do have to, um, when you do use a cover crop, you need to cut it down obviously. And then you would have to probably rototill it in to break that, uh, get that plant broke down even more into the soil. So I, I just, I just cover mine up because of where I live, I cover it up with the tarps. So it, it gives me the heat I need quicker. And plus I'm in a raised bed with um, cinder block. I have the cinder block fill, filled with gravel. So it keeps my beds hot. And then I just uncover and I don't have to do anything. I don't have any weeds. I don't have any problem, but cover crop is a good way to do it too. Just rototill it in. And then for the worm question, um, yes, you could do it, but I don't have the numbers off the top of my head how much castings you would need. It's like 10 pounds per um, 100 square feet. So you need a lot of worm castings. Worm castings are very expensive unless you have your own worm bins. So, but I don't remember the exact number of what you do, but you can use it for a top dressing. Um, yeah, next question is, uh, I find coffee grounds bring worms out of the soil. Is this an illusion or true? Uh, co coffee grounds are a food for worms. They love them, so they will come out to, to chow down on it. Um, okay, and the, have, uh, another question is, do you... Um, do you even, I think it's, uh, do you even remove the roots from beans or maybe it's, do you ever remove the roots from beans? I remove, yes, I, I remove everything because I don't want to have any roots. If there's any problems with diseases, I don't want to spread into my soil. So I, I remove the plant completely and uh, get it out of there. Corn, I only, I only grow a few things in my raised beds. I grow, um, some squashes, I grow peppers, I grow um, corn, tomatoes, green beans. Uh, that's all I usually grow. Um, okay, next, uh, next question is, uh, I just attended a training on landscaping for fire. They recommended you don't use wood mulch and wood chips if possible, since it burns. Instead, use cinder chips uh, if five to 10 feet from your house. Uh, did you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I go, if, you have, if you're in a fire zone, I would definitely follow the instructions for what they say to use. Um, I, I don't, I'm not in a fire zone, so I don't worry about that too much. I've got uh, five acres where I'm at, and mine's pretty much cleared around my home. Um, if, if, you're, if you're watering your plants, that usually that mulch is pretty wet and, it's, and, it, and it breaks down. So usually the, the uh, chips are pretty good and I don't, you know, I can't give you an honest answer on it. So I better stay clear of that one. <laughs> um, yeah, question just came up. Uh, what organic fertilizer can I use for lawn instead of synthetic fertilizer? Um, you would have to, usually the, where I get my fertilizer, I go to a, like a farm store or, um, a Wilco or something like that. And I talked to the, they usually have a, a, a person there that um, recommends what type of uh, fertilizer to use and it just specifically ask for an organic fertilizer. Just, you just got to remember if you do use an organic fertilizer, it's a slower acting 
and it needs to be broke down by the microorganisms in the ground prior to feeding the grass. So that's the only difference between organic and inorganic. And that was uh, the last question through the chat. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to just type them in chat. Or if you would like to uh, ask Art your question out loud, you can uh, click the raise hand uh, icon. Oh, okay. Um, okay, it looks like um, Tom, um, I'm going to, you should be able to ask your question out loud now. Uh, it looks like you're still on mute, but if you unmute yourself, you should be able to ask your question. Um, here, I'll try to ask to unmute. Um, let's see here. Okay. Um, here, Tom, I, there is one other person uh, raising their hand. So I think I'll just um, uh, move on to them and then I'll, I'll circle back and uh, see if we can uh, get you to um, uh, ask your question out loud. Oh, let's see, Barbara. Here, okay, uh, Barbara, try um, to ask. Yeah, okay, okay there you are. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, Art, very informative presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I have a very um, clay soil. I was going to do a perk test, so I filled the hole. And the next day, 24 hours later, the hole was still full to the top. So um, I have an um, area that's grassy, that's very mushy. In fact, a lot of the grass is very mushy. But I thought the most mushy place I would try to transform into a bed and plant ferns and other plants that need um, water, thinking that the water would be absorbed more by plants than it would be sitting in on the grass. So I um, covered the area with um, cardboard last fall and um, put a little soil on it just to keep the cardboard from blowing away. So what would you recommend I do next? Should I put some um, planting soil down and try to work it in? Um, but I've got the cardboard down there. Or should I just put soil on top? What what would be my next step? Well, what you said you want to put ferns and stuff in there? Yeah, it's just something that will absorb more water than um, a layer of grass would. Yeah, you can um, add compost would mm -hmm. uh, would help, um, and or you can leave the cardboard down covered with a uh, let me think here. You could plant, you're, pl you're planning on leaving cardboard down and, and put the ferns and uh, cut holes into the cardboard and just put the ferns into the ground there and leave the cardboard there. Is that what your intention? Yeah, that, that was my original plan. But if you have a better idea, I would appreciate no, that it. That would work would fine. That would, um, that would reduce your weed problem. If you have a weed problem there or anything like that. Well, the grass is trying to come up through the cardboard right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that's going to be a problem because cardboard is very porous, and anything is going to try to come up through it. Mm -hmm. So you could mulch it and plant, or um, you could rototill it in. You could remove the cardboard. I mean, there's all kinds of options there. I would, what I would do is I would probably just cut holes into the cardboard and plant right there and then I'd cover it up with a mulch. Mm -hmm. Would you put any um, uh, soil on it since now it's, it's just, um, you know, the, the grass there that in this very wet place is just um, under the cardboard and it's level with the grass. Would, would you build that up to make it uh, more, to absorb water more or would you leave it level? I would probably leave it the way it is. Mm -hmm. um, I, and then I would plant my plants in there and I would make sure that they were plants that are, don't mind getting their feet wet. Mm -hmm. And 
I would make sure that those plants, if that's the kind of planting you want to do there, and I would make sure that they are very water tolerable, you know, and then um, plant and then I would mulch. And I wouldn't do a, you know, I wouldn't go out and do a big expensive thing. I would experiment little by little as mm -hmm. I go. So you're not throwing a whole bunch of costs in there all at one time. And then if you find something thrives, then just keep going with it. Or um, that's the way I would select how I would do that. Now, I was going to select plants that my friends are going to give me for free out of their yard, like some ferns and some grasses. Well, that's even cheaper yet. So yeah. that's why I, yeah. And then you can always <laughs> test it. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. You're not really out anything. So it's it's an experimentation. Anything is an experiment when you're doing stuff like this. You don't know how it's going to work until you try it. But the cardboard's a good way to go. The cardboard, will, you know, it'll deter weeds, and it also um, it heats that soil up because it it keeps everything hot. Mm. I use cardboard a lot. Okay, thanks, Art, very much. I hope that answered your question. Hey, um, this this is Marlene. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you, Marlene. Oh, yeah, okay. we can hear you. I have another quick suggestion, Art, and I'm sure you're familiar with lasagna gardening or la yes. making lasagna beds. Yep. That would might be another thing she could do. She's already started the with the uh, cardboard. Laying. You could just keep building it up. So basically, you're composting in place with your uh, greens and your browns and your greens and your browns until you build it up, and then you can start planting right in there as well. And uh, so it's kind of a little bit of a variation on what you were saying. Yes, it'll it'll dry it'll dry it out too for you a little bit. Yeah, and you can find out more information about lasagna gardening beds on uh, Master Composter Recycler site, Clark County Compost. Um, they have all information about doing a lasagna bed videos and everything. Thanks, Marley. Thank you. And uh, there was a comment related to the question uh, suggesting that backyard habitat program has excellent suggestions for native plants for rainwater gardens or areas that have a lot of water. Oh, um, rain! Yeah, speaking of rainwater gardens, that's an excellent idea right there. There's uh, Washington State University has a good uh, pamphlet out on that, and you can just uh, you can just um, as you as you have a collection point like that, you can just um, recede it back up the hill if you have a hill in there, and uh, put your wetter plants in the bottom, and then work your way up. And it looks like um, uh, Tom uh, wrote uh, the question into the chat instead. So uh, Tom's question is: um, I have a swamp grass problem. Uh, as in uh, Alluvia area of Cowlitz County, how do I control it so as not to overtake my garden area as it moves quickly? Uh, swamp grass, you're gonna have to, you're gonna, uh, you could cover it, make a barrier, and that should deter the swamp grass from keeping on going, put a, a plastic down or cardboard or uh, lots of mulch and keep it away from the garden. It takes a lot of mulch, so it takes uh, usually four to six inches of mulch to keep the the grass from growing into there. But you can bury, you make a barrier, and stop it from growing into that area. Um, yeah, we did have a, a question come in earlier, um, wondering if you had heard of uh, Dr. Jim's fertilizer out of Idaho. That's J I M Z, Dr. James. I have not. Um, and then um, another question. Um, I understand some compost to purchase have weed seeds, et cetera. Where is a reputable place to purchase? Um, where, oh, there's, there's a very good compost here up in Rainier, Washington. Um, oh, north, northwest, 
I just know they're in Rainier. Just look up organic compost from uh, Rainier, Washington. It'll give you a, a, they're one of the best ones I know around. And yeah, you do have to be careful with weed seeds. If it's done right, if composting is done correctly, you don't have weeds in there because it has to get up the temperature. You, they usually heat it up to uh, 140 to 160 degrees and it shouldn't have, it should kill most weed seeds. Okay, um, next question is, um, can you explain permaculture in the New Mexico area? I have a high desert environment versus rainwater problems. Uh, permaculture, I, I cannot. I'd have to look it up and do some research on it. Okay. Um, I believe got to, yeah, all the questions in the chats. Um, again, if you have a question, uh, feel free to type it into the chat or you can raise the hand and I can um, give you uh, permission to ask your question out loud. Uh, Oh, it looks like uh, Shirley uh, added some information about Dr. Jim's oh, good. Uh, in the chat too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, do we have uh, any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Marlene, uh, oh, actually, one just came in. Um, uh, any suggestions uh, for the very mushy grass area of my lawn? I would compost it. Add compost, that usually takes care of it, and you just, you have to work it in. Is it a, is it a low spot from the long, lot of range you're getting? Or is that what's causing the problem? Uh, Barbara says, uh, very heavy clay. Mm -hmm. very, yes. Yeah, the only way you're going to break the clay down is amend it. It takes, I've been working on my gardens for, um, well, since 2005. So my soil is pretty good. Um, it, it, you can't do it in one year. It takes many, many years. And you just keep adding and adding and adding and working it in and working it in. And finally, you get it to where you want it. And then it just gets easier and easier as you go. I've known people that have been working on their gardens for 10, 15 years now, trying to get that soil the way they want it. And it just takes a long time. Um, I, my, my soil, I, the only reason I, I got a saving grace is because I've added my soil to my beds. And um, that made it a lot easier. I, I got a head start on everybody. And there was a there was a question about permaculture, and I've I've got one of my if if you remember the one picture, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back a little bit here on my bed, and if let me show you the whole, okay right, okay as you're looking at this this left bed over here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but that left bed right there is a hugel culture bed. So what I've done is all this soil was removed at one time and I put logs in there. So that's basically a permaculture, what somebody was asking about. And then I've covered this all in with soil. So I, I buried the logs and this is all covered now with, with uh, soil. And this is my corn bed. This is the one I grow my corn. So I very seldom have to water it because of all the logs down there. It's just like a sponge and it, re, and it holds that water in there for me. So that, that was an experimental bed right there. And it's worked great. I've had that for um, uh, eight years now, those logs down there. And it's, it's just been phenomenal. 
So it hasn't shrunk down very much, but I make my compost bins are over here. These, um, these two by fours that you can see with the, the galvanized poles in the ground. And my compost bins are right there, right along. I got three of them. So what I do is I just fill these up with leaves and uh, grass clippings. And I, um, I have a, a front loader, so I don't turn any of this stuff by hand. I take my front loader in here and I drive it in and I flip all my compost with the front loader. So I'm constantly turning it. So that's how I make my compost. Okay. Um, uh, another question was, um, how do I add uh, compost to grass or lawn? If you if you're trying to get um, if you're trying to if you're breaking it down and want to replant seed, you can rototill it in, or else you can just spread the compost over top and the grass will take over. So you can just uh, put a top dressing over there and the grass will come up through it. But it depends on what you want to do. Um, I just want to uh, answer, I'll answer Juliet's question about uh, the slides and uh, I'll send um, a follow-up email uh, to everyone who registered that I'll have a, a link to the recording uh, as well as uh, a link to the slides. So everyone will have um, access to, to both those. Um, and uh, another question is, um, I bought a rotating composter in September for kitchen scraps, added in leaves, and now have a smelly mess. What should it look like when it's done? What ratio of brown to green should I be using? When you're making compost, they recommend using one part green to two to three parts brown. So if you're getting a smelly mess, in your compost pile, it's because you have too much greens in there. So you need to add more browns. And the turners work very nicely. Um, sometimes they get too heavy and they're a problem turning, but if, if it's too wet, add brown. And if it smells, add brown. And that'll filtrate it out and it'll dry it out for you. So browns are your leaves, your you can you can even put shredded paper in there and that works as a good brown and that'll all break down um actually uh tom had a, a question about the photo of uh, your garden um what sure. do the metal rods in your compost do oh on the compost mm -hmm. <laughs> the 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 galvanized poles, I just use them to separate each bin. So I, I put two by fours and mounted them on there and I made them. So I, I keep, I've got three bins going. So I just keep the bins separated by the different areas. And that's what the poles do. And it just keeps them separated for a three bin system. Okay, that was the, um, the last question in the chat. Um, okay, another one just came in. Um, I have a lot of horse manure. How do you rate that as a compost versus chicken? Um, horse manure is uh, horse, cow, chicken. Um, as You just have to make sure that it's aged and um, let it sit. You don't want to put it in there hot because it'll burn everything. Uh, manures are good. Horse manure can have um, weeds. You have to be careful of horse manure over the cow and the chicken manure. So horse manure, you can end up with weeds in your beds. So the house or the cow has a four chambers in the stomach and it breaks it down a little bit better. Horse manure, unfortunately, does not break it down as well. And I use chicken manure. I got chickens also. I use chicken manure a lot.
Uh, any other questions? Mm -hmm. Did we have a raised hand, Elliot? Uh, do not see a raised hand. Oh, okay. um, Thought I saw one. Oh, oh, oh there's one. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Becky, if you unmute yourself, you should be able to ask your question out loud. And I can. And so you, if you, uh, Becky, if you're able to just uh, unmute, you should be able to uh, ask her a question now. Oh, um, well, um, let's see if there's uh, um, any other questions, feel free to ask that. And Becky, you're uh, just as long as you, um, if you're able to unmute, you can ask your question and we'll, we'll just be on standby. Um, yes, Marlene. No, I was just testing to see if there were raised oh. hands. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> um, Yeah, is there is there any any other question? Okay. Um, I'd love to get your question in, Becky. Um, but feel free to also uh, um, type in the chat if if. Um, it's not working for some reason. Um, oh, actually, um, one more a question just came in um, about ashes. Are they a good compost? Um, you have to do them very sparingly because ashes, if you're using wood ashes, they can increase your pH. So you get into an alkaline state and I just use them very, very sparingly. We had a um, we had a problem up here in the, the Lewis County area. A uh, guy he burned his fireplace all year long, and that's all he stuck in his uh, beds was fire ash, and um, he couldn't grow anything because his pH was way out of whack. So just um, be very very sparingly when you use wood ash. Maybe a bucket and mix it into a you know a, a hundred square foot bed just go very, very little. I, and I also can't stress enough about following the uh, instructions on fertilizer. Uh, you gotta be really careful with that too, cause you can end up burning all your plants. Uh, we, had a, we had another person that um, doubled the dose of fertilizer by accident. He didn't read the instructions right and, and ended up mixing double the dose and he ended up burning his whole field. So just be careful, make sure you follow the instructions and double check it before you actually put it on your crops. Uh, and Art, I just wanted to say too that there's been a, a few comments coming in. Thank you, thanking you for your presentation uh, and people expressing how they enjoyed it. Oh, good, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, well, if, if there aren't any, um, uh, then maybe, um, oh, yes, uh, just some more comments coming in saying thank you. Um, uh, then Marlene Art, uh, did you have any, any final, final comments? <laughs> no. No. Well, I just want to thank Art and thank you, Elliot, and uh, maybe you've given me some ideas. Uh, maybe we need to do another composting class so uh, I will check that out in the future so stay tuned if you're a member you'll get that information if you aren't check our website um, and maybe we'll have a compost class sometime this year and feel free to always check our website for some information feel free to join us 
let me know if you want to help us with the plant sale, etc. All that stuff will be coming out in Elliot's email. And I also include that information in my newsletters. And we actually have a, a site on the Canvas Library's YouTube page, a playlist with all of our past classes. So this one will be added to that as well. So again, thank you, Art and Elliot, and thanks for all, uh, all you attendees, and I hope you enjoyed it. Okay. Thank you, Marlene and Elliot. Thanks a lot. Yes, thanks, everyone, and uh, be on the lookout for that email. Right. Go plant some stuff. <laughs> all right. Have a good evening, everyone. You too, everybody. Bye. Bye, Bye now.